Hello, everyone. Welcome. Um, as you're entering in from the waiting room, really appreciate all of you coming. Uh, we'll just wait another minute or two as people can come into uh, our, our space today, and then we'll get underway. Okay, so I think we'll get going and get underway to um, honor everyone's time. Uh, thank you all very much uh, for joining us today. Uh, if we haven't met, um, my name is Patty Pond. I'm the president and CEO of Calgary Arts Development. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today for this virtual town hall uh, that is a bit of an update. Um, there's a number of things that have happened um, since our last update meeting, which uh, I don't know uh, for you, but for me feels like a lifetime ago, uh, but really it was just uh, only back in May. Uh, so uh, today um, I want to uh, begin as we always begin with an acknowledgement of the land and the land on which uh, we are meeting or I am uh, joining you today. Uh, we are on Mokhinstis, which is the Blackfoot name for the place we are on, Calgary. And it is the ancestral home of the Blackfoot people and the home of uh, the members of the Blackfoot Confederacy. Um, the, comprised of the Pikani, the Gainai, the Sutina, the um, Siksika First Nations, and the Stony Nakoda people, and of course the Métis people of Alberta Region 3. Um, while this is the ancestral home of our original peoples, we now call this place home for all of us, and it is my great honor and privilege to be a settler on this land and share in the care of this land. And um, when I think about the land acknowledgement, um, <clears throat> uh, and, and often I, I, I end my acknowledgement by saying, you know, the honor I have in taking care of sharing in the well being of this land, that includes the well being of its people. And, and that's all of you and, and all of us who call this place home. And I am particularly mindful of that, uh, given the conversation we are having today um, about the emergency resiliency funds that were entrusted to us by the city of Calgary um, uh, uh, last month, um, with the, the information and the research findings that our friends from Stone Olufsen will be sharing uh, with all of you today. Um, all of this is in support of caring for each other. Um, uh, in the very first uh, virtual town hall that we had back in May, no, March, sorry, <laughs> all those M months, um, I talked about people first, that we had to care about each other, we had to take care of each other. And um, in my experience over these last several months, that view hasn't changed for me. And it's been such a wonderful honor and privilege for me to work with uh, our team here at Calgary Arts Development as they designed uh, the programs related to the Emergency Resiliency Funds. Um, I hope that you'll see that context um, within uh, the program itself. So um, uh, my, uh, the CADA team is here. If you can look on the participants list, we've changed all of our names to put CADA at, as a prefix to our name so you know who we are. Um, um, for those of you who are joining us and our board members, I would welcome you and invite you to also um, put the CADA uh, a prefix in front. Uh, that's just a way for all of you to know. And if you want to privately message any of us, you're, you're welcome to do that. Please do. Um, our agenda for today I'm looking this way because my script is on this screen and I'm, my camera's on this screen. So um, 
Uh, our agenda today, uh, a number of things, uh, really an update on what's been happening with Calgary Arts Development recently. I'll give you a bit of an overview of 2019. For those of you who have been with us in the years past, we've um, traditionally held a, a, a report to community in, in alignment with the annual general meeting we have with our shareholder, uh, which is represented by City Council for the City of Calgary. Um, this year, we're doing a similar thing, but it's all virtual. So I'll provide you with a bit of an overview of 2019. And then my colleagues from the community investment team led by Sarah Bateman uh, will do a bit of an overview around the new program, the emergency resiliency funds and the two programs that are, um, um, have been designed uh, with that respect. Uh, then our, our friends uh, uh, Kim and Matt from Stone Olufsen will share some information with regard to the Experience Economy project that we've been a partner in, um, really around uh, research we've undertaken about Albertans' views on returning back to arts experiences in real life. So they've got some great updates and data there. Um, and then uh, a bit of an update on other uh, CADA um, projects and partner initiatives uh, that we are undertaking um, in the months and, and weeks ahead. So that's what we're going to cover today. Uh, before we get underway with all of that, I'm going over to Melissa to just give us the 411 on all things Zoom and technical um, in, in our meeting today. So over to you, Melissa. Hello, my friends, uh, and welcome. Uh, I want to shout out, uh, we have a, a new team member uh, running these events for us uh, as we move through the next uh, few weeks. Uh, Mark Lavalie is a wonderful friend um, who is helping us with the technology. If you have any issues with the technology, please message him or myself, or if you have any questions about the accessibility, we are here to assist with that. Uh, you'll notice that we have two ASL interpreters with us today. Uh, Janice is uh, speaking right now and Kimberly will be joining us. They both have named their videos ASL interpreter with their names. Uh, you can pin their video to be the main screen by clicking the three dots on top of the corner of their video screen. They will be swapping halfway through, so we will do a brief pause if you need to switch with that. Um, what I would recommend, however, if you're not speaking, please turn your videos off. That way, when you click the, the, that three dotted menu in your top right hand corner, you can click hide non video participants and that will show only the interpreter and the individual uh, who is speaking and that will be very beneficial for us. Um, click the uh, top menu as well to rename yourself. You may uh, change your name as well as provide your pronouns if you wish. We will be sharing screens for presentation and we know that does make it difficult for continuing to see the translators. Uh, you can use the toolbar at the top of your, again, top right hand of your screen to swap the video view so that the interpreter is larger. Unfortunately, this does make it a little bit more challenging to see the presentations, uh, but the speaking notes will be there and we will, of course, be recording this meeting for future reference and to share with the folks on our website. Uh, we do have a transcription app called otter.ai. Click the red box at the top of the screen if you would like to use it. Uh, they are working on other languages right now, but unfortunately for the time being, it is only in English. And because it is artificial intelligence, it is not 100% accurate, but it can be used to follow along with today's conversation and a fully edited transcript will also be available on our website. Please be aware that if you are using the chat box, which we highly encourage you to do so to share questions and comments with us as we move through today, uh, we have endeavored to make sure that your private chats remain private. However, as Zoom continues with their updates, there is a possibility that when we download the chat, we may be able to see your own private chats. Just keep that in mind. Know that the private chats will not be shared um, online as well. 
We'll be collecting questions uh, throughout the meeting. Myself and Gregory Burbage, my uh, colleague, will be collecting questions. Uh, so you can type them into the chat box and we will collect those from you. When we open the floor uh, to conversation, uh, from the participants list at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a raise hand function. We'll also be keeping track of those who have their hands raised. We really will endeavor to get to as many people as possible today, um, but if we uh, run out of time, uh, we will try to make sure that we get those uh, questions answered for you at a later date. I believe that is, oh, one more thing. Uh, when you speak, uh, please clearly state your name and then pause before speaking uh, so that the interpreters can catch up and people have time to find your screen. So if your Zoom username is different from the name you'll introduce yourself by, please update that um, right now. And I think at this point, then I will throw it back to either Patty or just move right on to Sarah. No, Patty will begin. All right, thank you, Patty. It's, it, it, it's me. It's all the patty all the time right now. Um, I'm just going to take a bit of time off the top here to talk a little bit about 2019. So um, uh, as I said, we traditionally at this time of year, we usually have a report to community where uh, we talk about what, what's happened in the year past and, and, and start to kind of paint a picture of, of what we think the year ahead will, will look like and, and where we find ourselves now. Um, something that was interesting is that our annual general meeting um, was a public meeting uh, in city council chambers. So I know that some of you um, may have been watching the, the live stream of that AGM back at the end of June. So um, the slides I'm going to share with you are the same as at, at the AGM. Um, uh, but again, if there are any questions you have, please feel free to put them in the chat or raise your hand as per Melissa's instructions, and I'm certainly happy to do that. But um, so I'll just give you a, a kind of a bit of a top line and ask Helen uh, if uh, she can start the uh, slides. Awesome. Uh, uh, thanks very much. So I guess I should have asked you to do this before. Um, so uh, 2019 was a, a quite a remarkable year. And as I was saying earlier, it almost felt like a lifetime ago. Um, uh, uh, so much has happened in 2020 um, that it was actually uh, really great for uh, me to be able to have this opportunity to reflect back a bit on um, uh, what uh, we started in, in 2019 and um, how it has helped us to, to where we are today. Uh, next slide, please. Um, when we made our case in 2018, so um, the way our budgets are prepared uh, with City Council is we make a four-year case for support. And so for the 2019 to 2022 budget cycle, the CADA team was um, making our case at the end of 2018. And it was at that time, as I know you're all aware, that we realized um, a transformational um, increase to our budget, we doubled uh, in size. And at that time, we identified three areas of impact that we believed this increased investment would affect. Um, one was social, as measured by increased offerings, events, and access for citizens, um, higher attendance, and, and that the arts offerings um, more closely reflected Calgary's demographics. Uh, and that's certainly something that we'll be talking about um, um, later on and have been talking about uh, this year uh, through another series of town halls. Uh, we had a youth area of impact, uh, which was about trying to stem the tide of a reduction in youth participation in the arts that we've been seeing since 2013. And then the last one, of course, is the economic impact, as demonstrated by the creation of more jobs, 
more artists being hired and increasing the annual value add or GDP, gross domestic product impact from the organizations that we were making grant investments to. In 2019, so the first year of our four year cycle, I am so pleased to announce that we moved the needle in all three of those areas. Next slide, please. Or, or not, oh, there we go. Yeah, next slide, thank you. <laughs> um, in, in 2019, uh, total attendance uh, saw that more Calgarians experienced the arts over 2018. We had increased youth participation for the first time since 2013. Our volunteer hours increased by almost 10%, which is significant. And even though we had more events downtown leading to a greater vibrancy, there were still events in all wards of the city with 49% of the total events taking place outside of the downtown core. Um, in, in 2019, the total number of events that, that were held were 13,300, just almost 13,400, and the total number of youth events was um, uh, just under 10,000. So once again, um, for all of those stats that you see on this slide, there were 23,000 events that were exhibited, produced, presented by just the organizations we made a grant to. So that doesn't include what else happens in private venues on Music Mile or at the Jubilee Auditorium, aside from the opera, the ballet, um, or the Saddle Dome with concerts. So the next time someone says to you, there's nothing to do in Calgary, you can just go, nah, -uh, j'accuse, that is not true. Because 23,000 events is a lot. Next slide, please. Um, earlier, I mentioned that one of the ways in which we are looking at our impact measures is to um, ensure that the programs and the organizations that we work with, that we have the honor of being partners with, um, more closely reflect Calgary. Um, you've heard me say like a broken record, we are Canada's third most diverse city. One in three Calgarians is a visible minority. And our programs should reflect that. The organizations that we work with, their stages, their exhibition spaces, their offices, their boards should reflect that. And so it was so great to be able to support folks like Lanry Ayahi with the inaugural Ethnic Arts Festival during Black History Month in February, and that his work contributed to a 46% increase in arts events for diverse and multicultural audiences, and a 10% increase in events that specifically engaged Indigenous communities. Next slide, please. And in particular, when I talk about right relations with the original peoples of this land, one of the highlights for me personally was our, our work with the Original Peoples Investment Program uh, for those from the First Nations, Métis, and Inuit community who now call Calgary and the surrounding Treaty 7 area home. Um, uh, uh, this program was led by Sable Sweetgrass from our team and an entirely um, um, uh, Indigenous uh, advisory circle who designed the program, who assessed the programs, who talked about how we could contribute most meaningfully through our program. And, um, and this is the result that you see here. And, um, and since then, we've seen the work um, that has been created uh, just be... Um, remarkable and astonishing and it's just been such a treat and a pleasure to um, see the strength of that circle and uh, and again I, I can't thank Sable enough for uh, her leadership 
uh, on that program. So uh, many kudos to you, Sable. Um, next slide, please. Uh, further on our journey of reconciliation, we held our staff retreat this year at Blackfoot, or last year, I'm sorry, at Blackfoot Crossing. We also held uh, just a remarkable gathering uh, led by uh, Sokokoto. Uh, he is an elder uh, with the Blood Tribe uh, who led us on an understanding of the land at Writing on Stone Provincial Park and of the wonderful work that you see by artists um, uh, on that site. Um, uh, for any of you who took part in our Mayor's Lunch last year, you saw the musical land acknowledgement this um, is the group that uh, was just so great in helping us um, uh, with that and we've received so many wonderful comments since then and of course our OPIP process and then uh, lastly Asana Geeks which in Blackfoot and I know I haven't said uh, I'm still working on my pronunciation means those who write those who draw and that is our dinner and dialogue series where we work to build relations between settler and indigenous community. So uh, it's just been such a wonderful and gratifying journey for me and I know for members of my team uh, 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 in this regard. Next slide, please. And then of course the economic impact more and more, we're all hearing uh, the importance of uh, the economy. And I am always very adamant about saying the arts pulls their weight for the $9.1 million that Calgary Arts Development invested in 2019 in grants. Those organizations primarily, so this doesn't even include the individual grants who generated economic output, $131 million plus was generated directly back into community. And you can, I don't, like, for those of you who are the economists in the room, um, that's a pretty good return on our $9 million. To see 131 of that go back, that represents a 5% increase. And the most significant part of that is back to people first. The good majority of that went into job creation, contracts for artists, and other people. Um, so the people help generate that direct economic output. And I think it's a really important note um, um, to make and to repeat again. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, when I talk about job creation, 1,064 additional jobs were created. Some of you may have seen the report. Uh, it was done quite a few years ago now by the Alberta Foundation for the Arts. And in it, the AFA report reported that for every additional million dollars that goes into the arts, 22 jobs are created. And in 2019, we actually hit that benchmark and then some. Um, so uh, a million bucks into oil and gas, by the way, which is particularly interesting to note at this time, two jobs are created. Now part of that is what are the salaries relative to, um, but the job creation piece, people first, getting people back to work, that's what the arts do. That's what the arts sector did in 2019. Might be a different case in 2020, but that will be for next year's conversation. Um, in addition, so full-time equivalents that we uh, were hired by the sector uh, were a 168. And the number of additional artists that were hired uh, over uh, 2018 was um, 896. So there were uh, in total 884 full-time equivalent jobs and the number of artists was 9,420. Next slide. Uh, now, as I mentioned, I talked about $9.1 million uh, was invested through our grant investment programs in 2019. That was a 102% increase in our grant investments over 2018. So a doubling and then some of our programs. Um, and uh, the way that we were able to work with the sector and to see the kind of movement, those increases that I mentioned earlier, is a real testament to um, you in the sector who responded so well to the programs that we talked about. When we made our case to city council, we talked about a good chunk of the increase was gonna be about catching up, that historically we were behind per capita 
to our colleagues in other cities across Canada. We were at the bottom. And by the way, doubling up shot us to the middle of the pack. So we're still not up there with Toronto or Vancouver or even Edmonton. We're closer, but we're not there. And, um, and even in that context of catch up, you still managed to show more to hire back those artists that you couldn't hire the years before, to bring new jobs into the workforce that you couldn't do before. So um, that's a really notable accomplishment. And I hope that uh, uh, you share this with your boards because this is what you do. This is how you stretch the dollars. Next slide. Of course, the largest program that we administer, and this is in response to what the community has told us, is the operating grant program. It's um, the single largest request from our community when we asked the community, what is the thing that is most critical to your business model, your operating model? And what we heard was unrestricted, predictable funding streams. And that's what the operating grant program was. Um, uh, uh, the year before, uh, 7.3 million in 2019, we invested, I think, $4 million. And if I'm wrong, someone from my team will correct me in the chat box. Um, and so uh, that's uh, what I mean about we use, we thought it was catch up, and it was for sure. But even in that context, you were able to stretch those dollars to really help us, as I said, move the needle and show uh, progress um, um, uh, to our shareholder. Next slide. In the last several weeks, um, this slide has become even more important for us to talk about, and that is our commitment to equity, diversity, inclusion, and accessibility. Um, um, this is Toyin. Uh, on, on, my, on the left, as you're facing the screen, uh, who founded the Immigrant Council for Arts Innovation. And um, uh, it, I guess our commitment to EDIA is most visible through our programs and our ability to put the dollars in the hands of the very communities who have the closest and most direct connections to underserved and underrepresented communities. And um, we have more work to do in that regard. And, and some of you have likely joined us um, for conversations we've been having for the last couple of weeks concerning anti-racism and our work around equity, diversity, inclusion, and access. Um, I know that some of you were uh, with me today earlier on a call where we heard from a number of BIPOC artists who shared uh, their own personal experiences in Calgary's arts community, and it was heartbreaking. And, um, Kata's commitment to uh, create better systems um, is, is something that I take very seriously. And um, uh, we invite uh, any of you to come along with us on this journey. It's an important thing for us to consider as we talk about 2020 and beyond. Next slide, please. Another uh, 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 area of work that we've undertaken is the Artist as Changemakers program, which is in its third, what was in its third year in 2019. And in 2019, we put the passion and the work and the practice of artists who use change making as part of their practice into action by partnering with organizations Action Dignity, Calgary on Purpose, and Trico Homes to use artists in addressing complex challenges of arts and social justice, arts and belonging, and creative living in place for seniors. Um, and you'll, I'm sure you'll recognize many of the faces uh, uh, on that slide. Next one, please. Arts led city building is the second of our two strategic priorities. Our first one is, of course, um, fostering a sustainable and resilient arts sector, primarily through our granting programs, through our knowledge and research, and you'll hear about some of that uh, very shortly from Matt and Kim. Um, and uh, uh, the second um, uh, priority of two for us is, is as I've said, arts-led city building. Um, in 2019, uh, we partnered uh, with a number of organizations um, 
that presented uh, or produced We Will Rock You, a 21 city um, a North American tour where over half of the cast and crew uh, were from Alberta and a good majority of that part of Alberta uh, crew and artists were Calgarian and got 21 weeks worth of work. Um, we also invested in the Glow Festival downtown where a number of artists and arts-led projects were featured. We had the Off Country Festival that coincided with the Canadian Country Music Awards that generated, I think it was $18 million in economic um, activity for Calgary. And we, were, we partnered with Stagehand Live and Unexpected, who initiated and inaugurated a buskers program uh, at the International Airport, YYC. And um, in their first year of the program, artists were paid as well as able to receive um, tips from, from um, uh, uh, travelers. Uh, YYC received a North American award from their industry association in marketing and engagement for this program. And pre-COVID-19, Stagehand was having conversations with New Orleans um, uh, uh, and uh, other cities in North America uh, to do a similar program there. Um, next slide. So that's a, a, a bit of an overview of 2019. Um, it feels kind of weird to be talking about 2019 and knowing what we know has happened uh, in 2020. Um, however, I think what it did for me as a reminder was um, reaffirm for me the confidence and the belief I have in the power of the arts to make a difference and to make a difference on those three kind of pillars I talked to, social, youth, economic, and so much more beyond that. Um, um, during COVID-19, look at how Calgarians have leaned on the arts and particularly Calgary arts. That's a very palpable, um, real thing that people notice. And so I think the opportunity is here for us to continue that as we look ahead to what the road might look like. So in that context, I'm going to hand it over to Sarah Bateman, our Director of Community Investment and Engagement, to share with you um, um, some more about the $2 million in emergency resiliency funds and the programs that have been designed. Thanks so much, Sarah. Thanks, Patty. Hello, everybody. I'm Sarah Bateman, um, and I'm going to try to share my screen. I'm going to keep this pretty high level um, uh, today. We've, we launched the, um, the Emergency Resiliency Fund a couple weeks ago, about a week and a half ago, and so it's been on our website, but we wanted to just have a place and time for people to be asked questions as we go through this. Um, so I'm just going to... Right. So uh, just a little bit of background and context. Back in May, middle of May, City Council approved as part of a wider community resiliency package, uh, $2 million for the arts um, in recovery and resiliency needs. So as we thought about designing this, uh, it was actually really tricky to design funding for a crisis that continues. And uh, as we saw the losses of revenue increase, we realized we couldn't go back to fix what is lost, but let's look ahead and build a funding program that can help build to the, um, the future that will come. We don't know what that's gonna look like. So we hope that these two phases that we have focused on recovery and resiliency will help build up some of the foundations and adaptability that we need for the sector. Um, the city did say that this was for arts organizations and while we know that there is a great need for artist support as well, um, this is an organizational focused grant program. And as we designed it, despite the difficulty, we were trying to make sure we had an it was accessible for all or arts organizations, uh, specifically nonprofit. So 
Um, and that kind of does create a couple of barriers, but it is nonprofit arts organization as per the mandate from the city. So the two uh, programs within the Emergency Resiliency Fund or the ERF, you will hear me say, is the Recovery Fund and the Resiliency Fund. Um, and the Recovery Fund is our first phase and then we'll go into the Resiliency. And that mirrors uh, the approach the city is taking for COVID recovery and uh, just so the arts can align with their, um, the city's mandate as well. So I'm gonna dive into the uh, recovery fund and maybe before I do, if you have any questions as I'm talking about this, my team is monitoring the chat. So you can either type your question in there or raise your hand and they will, and then I will answer the questions probably at the end. So I just wanna make sure everybody knows if they have questions, the chat's the best way to do that. Um, so the recovery fund, it's already open. Um, the deadline is for the letter of intent. So for those that are operating grant clients, all you have to do is send an email to our colleague Alicia and she'll make sure you get access to it. The other thing we're doing for operating grants uh, clients or applicants is if you've already applied for the operating grant increase, which the deadline was a couple of days ago, we're gonna port over the uh, information that's applicable into the uh, recovery fund application, but you have to let Alicia know if you want to apply for that to get access so you can review the information and add any other pertinent information. For those of you that did not apply for the um, uh, operating grant, um, you just have to send a letter of intent and that information is on our website and we will make sure you get access to it. So um, a little bit of more details is these will be grants up to a maximum of 50,000. We have a total pool for the reco recovery fund of a million dollars. Uh, so that's half of what the city gave us. And the intent of this one is really to say, how do you build up those foundational pieces of your organization so that you are ready or stronger for what's to come? Um, so what we've heard in some of the surveys that we've done is how do you put money to human resources to hold on to those people that you need for your long-term uh, re resiliency and sustainability? What kind of strategic or scenario planning do you need so you can prepare for what is to come? There's so many unknowns right now. So scenario planning, I think, is a really big one. This recovery fund is also to strengthen maybe some of your administration, your operations or technology pieces that you might need. And the online information goes into some of those deeper pieces, uh, some more details about it. But it's really about what you need to strengthen your organization because of losses um, from COVID. Everybody's trying to figure out what they need to be to be able to adapt to what's going. So this is again, just about foundational strengthening. And, uh, and so if you would like to put some money in to invest in some of those foundational uh, pieces, you can apply for this. Um, it's really to make your organization strong uh, in these times of COVID, or as maybe not strong, but in a better position to be able to uh, make decisions for your organization. Um, we are navigating really uncertain times. So uh, we know that it was actually, yeah, hard to design this with not knowing what we might need. So that led us to our second fund, which we're calling the Resiliency Fund. And again, because of the uncertainty of uh, COVID, we had started to hear some ideas that arts organizations were adapting, trying new things, as we have to, we can't go back to what is, so how do we start adapting to what will be? But because there's so much uncertainty, we designed this fund in two phases. We're taking in a first intake in September 14th, and the second one on October 19th. Um, again, grants are up to 50,000, and this time our pool is 1.15 million, and you, that's a little bit more, because we actually combined the project grant for organizations into this pool. And the reason we did that was we felt like most project grants for organizations this year, we only had 150,000 for that, but we felt like all of those projects would probably be adapted 
due to COVID, whether it's, you know, instead of having an inside event, you're having an outside or you're online or you have to adapt planning for COVID. So we felt like there was a reason to be able to uh, embed the project grant in here. So the resiliency fund is, you know, it can be um, something you want to try. It's for initiatives that contribute to the resiliency of your organization and the art sector. So um, it really, uh, we want to look at how you're adapting to the COVID uh, reality. We know we're not going back. So how do you, how are you adapting and trying things uh, as we go forward in despite this uncertainty? So it might be a new project or it might be changing some of your business models or, but we're really looking at adaptive uh, approaches as well as collaborative. One of the pieces we're starting to hear is different um, collaborations along a spectrum. Some people are sharing some resources all the way up to mergers and amalgamations. So there's a whole spectrum of collaboration and we think as we navigate these uncertain times of COVID, we are going to have to depend on our friends in the sector to do that. So, um, you know, that's going to be one of the criteria we look at is how are you thinking differently about your approach to how you're engaging your audience, how you're delivering your, your artistic practice and or how you're structured your organization. So those are some of the things we're looking at, both adaptive and collaborative for that. Um, yeah, so I wanted to keep this super high level. The recovery is really foundations for your organization and the resilience is how are you changing and how are you uh, adapting to what will be. Um, and you can apply for both. You don't have to apply for both, but you could. If you, so they're not connected, but you're eligible for that. So I just wanna make sure that that's, um, clear as well. So maybe what we'll do is we will open it up for a few questions and see if I can clarify anything. Um, Greg or Melissa, is there any questions? Oh, see a couple questions on our document. So can the money received be used for new endeavors related to COVID and what is the use restricted to? So yes, it can be uh, endeavors that are connected to COVID. Everybody is trying new things. Um, it's really around adapting what you have done in the past to meet this new reality. So um, it has to be related to a response to COVID, I think is the critical piece of it. So uh, that's the, the element. Uh, it might be something new or it might be an adaptation of something you're already doing. I hope that answers that question. Um, there's not a lot of restrictions uh, to this right now because of the uncertainty, but we wanna really make sure for the recovery, you have a very specific piece of your operations that you're investing in to strengthen. And for the resiliency, you're trying something different or collaborating to try to adapt to the new reality. And we want to keep it pretty open because there's so much we do not know in this COVID times. Um, do you choose phase one or phase two to apply for? I think I just answered that you can apply to both. So, um, and, you know, we kind of built it a little bit so that, you know, for those that apply to a recovery, they're building the foundation so they could adapt. Some arts organizations are at a very weak stage right now because of the COVID impact. So we want to make sure they have an opportunity for some investment in those critical pieces. And yep, so uh, JS, yep, we can apply to both funds. And what's the base, best way to book time with CADA to discuss these applications? Thanks, I actually missed some of my notes on that. So the, one of the challenges we had was we are also doing our operating grant uh, increase program right now, as well as our project grant for individuals and collectives. So my team is quite maxed out. So we've utilized other resources from within the team. Alicia Gordon is uh, helping us out this summer and she's your best contact for the recovery fund. So the first fund that's this summer. Her email is on our website, Alicia Gordon. And I'm not sure if Alicia, you if you're on the call, if you want to show your face, you don't have to. I don't want to put you on the spot. But, uh, oh, there's Alicia. 
So she's the person you will be in touch with for the recovery fund with your letter of intent, um, any questions you have, as well as for the operating grant clients uh, to get access and intent to apply. So she's your best person for the recovery. For resiliency, uh, the resiliency fund, which happens in the fall, we have Kaylee Bicycle. Uh, Kaylee, are you on the call? I don't, didn't see you on the participants, but Kaylee has been helping us for years at uh, CADA on a number of uh, projects and she'll be supported, both Alicia and Kaylee will be supported by our CI team uh, to answer any kind of trickier questions, but they're really going to help us put together the assessment uh, teams and the process of ensuring people have the strongest application. Um, and Greg or Melissa, is there anything I have missed? Uh, oh, grad, um, any, again, any questions that you have, um, for any of the of uh, any of the funds, you can always email our grants at calgaryartsdevelopment.com and our team will direct it to the right right folks as well. So I'm just making sure. Um, I'm just gonna stop sharing my screen, and see if there's anything else. Greg, Melissa, I know you're monitoring. Is there no Greg has just told me there's no missed questions. Again, if, if questions come up as you start looking at the guidelines, um, our team is here. Uh, you can give them a shout and uh, they'll be more than happy to help you answer the questions. And I think we're trying to keep this, um, we want to invest so we have a great art sector or as strong as possible art sector when we come out of this. Patty, do you want me to just transition to Matt or do you want to introduce Matt Tin Kim from Stone Olson? Uh, yeah, I'll do it because I also forgot something before. Okay, well then I'm going to pass it off to you. So I'm going to go back to Patty. Uh, again, if you have any other questions, you can put it in the chat or reach out to my team. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much, Sarah. And again, many thanks to the community investment team. Um, uh, for what it's worth, usually when we design a grant program, it takes us the better part of six months. And the team here has done this in less than four weeks. Um, and, and $2 million isn't a small amount. So as a public agency stewarding public dollars in the interest of the public good, which includes artists, by the way, um, uh, for the team to be able to pull this off is a testament to their expertise and their commitment to uh, the arts sector. So many, many thanks uh, to the team there. Um, uh, I just wanted to add something uh, in the chat box. Uh, Carrie uh, Watson from our team very kindly put the link to our 2019 accountability report. So all those stats and, and the numbers that I talked about are in a report that we have on our website. The link is in the chat box. So if you want to look it up, please feel free to do so. Uh, we also publish our financial statements. So if you want to look at how we divvied up the whole, uh, 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 I think our budget last year was 12 million, just over $12 million. Um, you can see how we did that through the financial statement. So please have a look on the website if you wanna know more. Uh, Matthew Stone and Kim Griffin are our friends from Stone Olufsen, and they've been um, leading a, a longitudinal study with Albertan audiences to deliver reliable and relevant data about how Albertans are re reacting to what's happening around us. Um, so uh, we've had the great pleasure of working uh, with, with Matt and Tim and Kim and the team over at, uh, at their firm for a number of years. And um, uh, they've just been wonderful uh, collaborators and, and sometimes co-conspirators um, in our work to make the case for the arts for Calgary and with Calgary. So thank you very much for joining us today and for undertaking this work. And I'll hand it over to uh, Matt and Kim. Great, thanks for having us, Patty. I really appreciate it, uh, everybody at the CADA team for having us at this town hall and including us here today. I'm gonna share my screen. Um, I've got a lot that I wanna share and um, I uh, look forward to, oh, Looks like Zoom wants to, oh, so that worked. Great. 
Great. Okay. Did that work there? Did everybody see my screen or no? There we go. There we go. Okay. Um, well, as Patty mentioned, we've been working on a longitudinal study, and that's uh, research speak for uh, the really. Uh, we're doing a year-long study with Albertans to go back to them several times over the next year to talk to them about how they engage with the experience economy and the arts in particular and sports and recreation as well um, over the next year. Um, before I jump into the results, it's really important um, to say thank you to all our sponsors. Um, CADA in particular, Patty and Sarah, were the first to jump on board and really lead the way, followed quickly by Simon and his team at the Rosé Foundation. But um, as you look through our sponsors, we appreciate their support. This is, uh, we're doing it at cost, but they're also funding all the costs. So the Alberta Foundation for the Arts, uh, Travel Alberta, Edmonton Arts Council, Edmonton Community Foundation, Calgary Foundation, ATB, as well as support from Angus Reed AT, uh, and Active City. Um, these organizations are progressive and they recognize the need to support organizations who are delivering remarkable experiences to uh, Albertans and Canadians and Calgarians in particular. And we couldn't do it without them. Um, so thank you very, very much. Um, your, your leadership is most appreciated. Um, as Patty had mentioned, this is a longitudinal study um, and everything starts here. So um, all of the information we're going to present to you today is uh, at the tip of an iceberg. That's, there's a lot more depth available. If you want more information, go to uh, the website here, stoneolson.com slash the new experience economy. And um, you can sign up, you can get reports delivered to you when they're come available, uh, detailed uh, data, as well as workshops when we're presenting and sharing information, as well as booster uh, specific reports on Edmonton and Calgary. Um, the whole point of this work, though, is not to collect data, it's really to support your recovery. Um, organizations in the experience economy in the arts and culture sector need good data about their audiences and understanding what it's going to take to bring them back and how to reconnect with them. Uh, the Calgary arts community in particular has been way out in front of most organizations. If you looked at uh, the previous sponsors, you'll recognize that there's a real leadership from the arts community more than anybody else who's pushing it. So this is what this is about, giving you the data so that you can plan, develop your marketing and promotions, work on engagement over the long, uh, longer term. And this is gonna be the first of several waves and we're gonna build on the data as we go so that by September, when we're starting to get closer and closer to potentially, hopefully reopening um, and reconnecting on a live basis, you can have more actionable data. This first data is all about getting uh, to understand where people are just as we're coming out of the first wave of restrictions. So you have an Alberta wide report, you have boosters in Edmonton and Calgary, there's detailed data if you want, as well as if you have questions, we encourage you to contact us. We're here to help. Um, we'll do what we can. If you have specific questions about the data, please feel free to email us and we will certainly uh, get back to you and uh, talk to you, do what we can to, um, to uh, share the data. So with that. Uh, Matt, just a note uh, from our, our ASL interpreters, you just need to slow down a little bit. So they Yeah, can thank you for that. I appreciate it. I just saw a text from Kim as well. I appreciate it. Um, so a little bit about the research process. Um, this study is done across Alberta. The reason why we've done it in Alberta is that there are a lot of national studies out there that we're all seeing. There's great studies in the US as well about visitor intent to cultural institutions, and those are great, but Alberta is a unique market, and the people here in Alberta have unique circumstances. So it doesn't do much good for organizations in Calgary to look at data from Toronto, and we wanna make sure that you have actionable data about your audiences. So this was done in the end of May, at the end of the first wave of restrictions coming out, uh, we did an online survey with 1,348 Albertans, and that included boosters in Edmonton and Calgary, so almost 500. So you have really reliable data. Um, Everybody is recruited through Angus Reid Forum. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with research, Angus Reid's name has been around for a long time. They are a leader in sample providing, so they have the best quality uh, respondents to talk to. And then everything that we did, we sampled to make it sure it was balanced by region, but we also did some statistical weighting to ensure that the results that you're looking at look like the audiences you're trying to reach. This is not the same as talking to your members or your subscribers or your ticket buyers. This is the wider Alberta audience, so keep that in mind. Um, one other thing is before we jump through the results, um, I think it's really important to remember that all research, uh, any research we do is a snapshot in time, but it doesn't occur in a vacuum. 
everything around us is influencing people's perceptions. And we're all familiar with these COVID charts. And I think if anybody had asked us in February what these kinds of data would mean, none of us would know. But now we're all experts on COVID and different types of pandemic data. Um, this, this will matter to us as we're looking at the results. And we all know that the cases were higher in Calgary and in Edmonton, uh, less in the north and, and the central zone, somewhat in the south. Um, this kind of information matters and it all has an impact on how people feel. And so as you're looking at the data, keep in mind that even the more current circumstances like weather, yes, believe it or not, weather will impact how people feel about re-engaging with uh, their community. The other big context that is like a shadow looming over um, this whole situation is the economic backdrop. Um, the circumstances in Alberta are unique. Yes, everybody across around the world is having a hard time reckoning with the pandemic and with the impacts of that, what that means for how we engage. But in Alberta, we're facing the dual whammy of an economic recession caused by a historic crash in energy prices. And while they might rebound slightly, the effects of this are gonna last a long time. So we know that unemployment has changed dramatically since the start of COVID-19, about 50% have seen their employment change. A large portion of that have seen their been laid off or had their hours cut. And we've seen fully 46% have seen their wages or income decrease. Now, yes, a large portion of that is with the pandemic, 73%, but a lot of it, 22%, is also related to the energy prices. And what that means for arts organizations in particular, and anybody in the experience economy, is that expenditures on the experience economy are a valuable and important part of quality of life, but they're also discretionary. So people's willingness or ability to pay is going to be significantly hampered for the foreseeable future. So while we look at all this data and you think about your plans, keep in mind these contexts because they're going to influence our audience's ability to reconnect with us. Um, the whole point of this research is to start to understand the behaviors and the motivations behind them. Um, Patty, you remarked on 23,000 events, and I think most people would be stunned to hear that much. But when you think about it, there are tons and tons of experiences being offered to uh, Albertans. And there are different ways that people can engage with the experience economy. We look at it not just a matter of attending. It's also a matter with the rise of uh, digital media, particularly during the pandemic, but always for the last three or four years, um, the spread of media in which people can absorb content and engage with arts experiences has grown. Um, even in the last uh, civic arts engagement research, we saw the rise of digital. Audiences are gonna engage that way and we cannot ignore it. Some of our biggest fans only uh, engage with us in that way. They also attend, so that is a category of experiences where people are going to the theater, or going to arts events, festivals, galleries, all of it, live performances of all kinds. And then finally, there is the do. And when it comes to arts, this is a really critical one because there are so many ways that people can engage with the arts that way. Um, that makes it really, really important as part of their engagement. And in some cases, we see communities more likely to engage through observing and doing than they are through attending. Um, all of this is things that we're watching and different ways that you can start to connect with your audience. So we, that's how we looked at it for this study. And when we looked at how people are connecting, about 99% of Albertans are engaged with the art experience economy in one way or another. That's massive. Um, if anybody's a policymaker at the provincial level, you can't ignore that. Patty, you talked about the economic impact earlier. This is all a net symptom of that. A lot of it is through doing, observing 82% are downloading content or watching content, 89% um, attending in some way, shape or form, and then 94% doing. Now we've excluded some things that include things like watching TV or just reading a newspaper or things like that. We're trying to get to more robust definition. And even when we do that, we see high levels of participation. I'm gonna come back to this because it's really symptomatic of how we want to engage with the community. Now, just as important as what people are doing, and probably more important, is why they're doing it. And think about it from the context of, as we move forward, what people will be doing is going to be different. Simple fact. Um, the fact is, is that we can't necessarily reach them with the same activities in the next year, but we can appeal to their motivations. And when we ask people why they participate by attending, social and experiential motivations are extremely important. And this is not new. 
Albertans are highly motivated to connect with each other and they use the experiences in the arts and culture, but also in sports and recreation, festivals, events, tourism and hospitality to do that as well. So they're to get out of the house and social, to socialize with friends, to be with family, to meet new people. Those are all highly social things and we use our experiences as the backdrop for that. There is also the experiential motivations to be entertained and to have fun, uh, to try something unique or different, to be part of something exclusive. Um, and these are all part of thing, uh, this. And as we look at it, these motivations become really, really important for organizations looking to reconnect with Albertans. It's not gonna be a matter of offering the same things, but you can appeal to their social desires. One other point actually I wanna point out is, is that um, um, among their motivations, we see that 83% social. And when you see a lot of the other data out there, there's some great data, Colleen Dylan Schneider is putting out some great research in the US about visitor intentions and people's desire to wanna to do more. Uh, as much as I love that work, it's important to keep that with a grain of salt because intentions are normalizing someone. I think the most recent round of research has talked about that a little bit, um, but they might be inflated somewhat because people's desires to re-engage and they want to reconnect and they're motivated to reconnect with people in an environment where our social uh, and world has been limited for physical distance, social distancing reasons. Um, but we have to temper that with their actual comfort to do it. So I may have a desire to do it. And you could even ask me, say, you know what, what's your intention to go to the Gopher Museum in Toefield? Well, it'd be really high if I've been cooped up in an apartment, but my necessarily comfort in going to do it may not be there. So we have to really come back to that motivation and their comfort. Kim will talk a little more about comfort. Their motivations for doing um, are similar, except we'd also see a rise in health uh, and education. Experiential is really, really important, but so is social remains very, very important and health motivations. So it's not just physical health, but it's also mental health. And that cannot be discounted. It's a really important part of why people connect by doing and creating art. Now, 99% of Albertans are pursuing the experiences. And if there's one thing we've learned over time is that um, in Alberta, there's not necessarily unique uh, audiences for arts and culture only or other things. In fact, we see that 62% of Albertans will say they'll participate in a festival, but only 1% will do that exclusively and only festivals. And when we ask about arts and culture, Three quarters of the population will participate in one way or another, either by observing, attending, or doing. But only 8% are exclusively doing arts and culture and nothing else. When we look at sports and recreation, we see a little bit more exclusivity with 17%, but high participation rate, and the same applies to travel. What this tells us is a couple of things. One is that there's high overlap. The audiences that are gonna be going to theater are also gonna be those who are gonna have kids in soccer. Those who might be going to galleries or taking in contemporary art are also the ones who are going to be going to a hockey game. Albertans tend to be um, sector agnostic and more in pursuit of broader experiences and their motivations for fulfilling them are absolutely critical. So we're going to come back to this, but one of the points is these motivations and this overlap are going to create opportunities for organizations to engage. Kim? Thanks, Matt. I'm just muting, and I see that you got it wrong with the Gopher Museum. It's in Torrington. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> All right. Thanks again. So I'm going to continue this conversation, and where I'd like to lead us now is that discussion on engagement and substitution and what that looks like. And the reason this becomes important is you as arts organizations are continuing to look and how you can adapt your offerings. And right now still remain relevant from afar even as things are starting to ramp up and open up it's important to know how your audiences feel about substitutions so matthew talked about the importance of socialization and this we really can't overstate how important this is this is something that albertans are craving and some of our data starts to show that there's a bit of a fatigue setting in with substitutes I'm sure most of you can understand that. We've been at this now for a number of months and there's only so long you can sit in front of a digital screen. So that's an important thing to understand. 81% of Albertans said that they value the social connections they have more than ever. So there's that desire to reconnect. Uh, but another, but 72% also say that they're getting tired of substitutes for the things that I used to do. So what that tells us is there's that desire, that 
to want to re-engage socially, but there's a nervousness to resume. So the combination of fatigue but hesitation means you really need to rethink how effectively you can stay connected with your audiences right now. I'm not, Matt, you can actually go ahead and forward. Um, the other thing I just want to note is that even among regional audiences, nervousness is a bit higher among Calgarians, and that goes back to what Matt said about context. We had a higher caseload at the beginning, we were slower to go into phase one, so that would make sense. Okay, so right now, about half of Albertans are engaged with their usual activity in some way, shape, or form. This question is trying to get a, a, get a sense of what people are doing and how closely they're connecting to their usual activities, primarily through a digital lens. So we can start to understand who's anxious to get back at it and who's sitting back a little bit more. The one thing I want to draw your attention to is that 37% of Albertans who up until now have been sitting back and say that they've been voiding most of their usual activities at this time. This is a large chunk of audiences that you haven't been reaching until now. Now, at the time that we did this work, many were still transitioning to work from home or perhaps taking their kids through school. So there's a bit of preoccupation there. Uh, but I think that's really important to note that we have a large proportion of Albertans that this whole set of circumstances has caused them to just pause and sit back. They're not even thinking about how to engage with different organizations or activities as of yet. Okay, so that's a little bit about substitution and engagement. And what I hope it does is just give you some sense of how Albertans are thinking about engaging in their usual activities and how you might be able to reach them. But one of the things that's really going to be important to understand going forward is comfort levels. This is really, really critical. So I'd like to take you through a couple of things here. We've covered off what Albertans did. Matthew spoke to that, what they're doing now and how they view certain activities. The next layer then is assessing comfort levels. Um, again, a lot of engagement will simply hinge on this. So broadly speaking, when we ask Albertans what their perceptions are and their comfort levels are with group settings, you can see here about 25% would be quite comfortable with large groups of people. That's really an eight, a nine, or a 10 on a 10 point scale. But if we were to have urge this out right now, Albertans are probably sitting at about a 5.5. So right now, most Albertans are just feeling comfortable with their own social groups. And obviously that's going to have implications and we're gonna to need to monitor this as you start to think about how you can open doors and how comfortable people will be around others. So comfort level with people is one thing, but what about feelings? Feelings are absolutely mixed, but the one thing to note is that we're seeing a high level of worry that's also permeating our perceptions. And then of course, that permeates anticipated behaviors or intentions to do things. So 37% of Albertans are feeling worried right now. And when we ask this among Calgarians, it's actually a little bit higher. And again, context matters, right? Higher caseloads. Um, Calgary and Edmonton were obviously a little bit more dense too. So there's some, some factors like that that play into this. Only 31% of Albertans are feeling optimistic. This is at the end of May and 22% are indifferent. And what's interesting to me is in that indifferent category, it's a little bit higher among families or people with children. So it's a bit of a tug and pull there, I think, between wanting to get out and get your kids out of the house uh, with being a little cautious. But it's important to understand we're feeling sick. That's another layer to that comfort. Okay, when we look at perceptions of Albertans, we really get a sense of how complex this issue is facing Albertans. And it's simply not about offering hand sanitizer and safety protocols and just opening the doors, although I suspect everyone here knows that. Uh, but attitudes really matter. So 76% of Albertans say that no matter what happens, things are not going to be the same. So there's a sense of resignation already setting in. We know things are going to be different. 62% say that they're wary about interacting with people I don't know. And at the time of fielding, that was higher in Calgary. 51% uh, would be fine wearing a mask, a little bit higher in Calgary as well. So you start to see a bit of a tension between people being nervous, but being considering different uh, things to make them feel comfortable. But what really demonstrates how complex this issue is, is a couple of statements towards the bottom. Half of Albertans, 49%, think energy prices are a more serious problem than COVID-19. 
And that speaks to what Matthew talked about at the beginning about discretionary spending over the long term and how that might affect Albertans. And then another 43% think this whole thing has been blown out of proportion. So you can already see that tension between wanting to go out, wanting to resume activities, but being nervous about some other different things. And the other thing to note is that, and of course, attitudes are really not universal. I pointed out a couple regional differences and where Calgary stands out. But as, in, as arts organizations, as you start to continue re-engagement strategies, this is where it becomes really critical to understand who your audience is so you know what they're thinking. Um, there are some gender differences. Those that identify as female tend to be a little bit more wary and less likely to think this has been blown out of proportion. By age, there's some, some generalizations here as well. Younger adults also a little bit more wary. I talked about Calgary, um, people in urban centers, a little bit more wary of crowds, but also a bit more comfortable with masks. We have a density, um, a different density, but we also have differences in age within our urban centers. And then for those that do frequent arts and culture events more frequently, they are also a little less comfortable overall. So I think that will become really important as arts organizations start to think about the time frame of how you're going to be able to offer in-person events over the long term. So the last thing I'll leave you with before I turn it back to Matthew is the next question then becomes, well, what do we need to increase comfort? Um, why this is important is we just want to get, a, again, a really complete understanding of where Albertans are thinking and where their mindset is with respect to what happens next. So 30% of Albertans, a little bit higher in Calgary, are waiting for a vaccine or a cure. 30% uh, also see that just having reliable statistics makes them feel at ease and more comfortable going forward. But what I want to draw your attention to is that 18% at the bottom, and it might seem large, but 18% just need time to pass. They may not be sure what they're looking for in the comfort front, but when you combine that with the 30% who are waiting for a vaccine, that's nearly half the market that just needs to wait it out. So again, there's some implications there when you think about what that return to normal period is and how long that might need to be drawn out or how your planning might have to reflect that if there's a large swath of the provincial audience that just needs some time here. We're just not ready to go, despite, again, what intentions might be or what we want to do. Thanks, Kim. Um, there are, well, like I said, there's a ton of uh, data there and we wanted to pull together a few things for you to be thinking about, some thought starters as you think about your recovery planning. Um, the first thing that we've learned is obviously is that uh, the experienced economy is massive. 99% um, is a massive number and there's a, a large overlap between sectors. So that means that you're going to be sharing audiences that are actively pursuing experiences without necessarily having massive amounts of fans in any vertical sector. So for those of you in the arts sector particularly, you have to think about how your audiences are pursuing experiences and uh, and instead of a particular art form or a particular sport. And if that's the case, how can you appeal to that? Uh, that might mean that you have to broaden the uh, promise of experience in your marketing or in your, your re-engagement activities or your online activities as well. The other thing that it raises was so much overlap and with some sports and recreation activities being open sooner than later, um, there might be opportunities for experienced organizations to collaborate. And we're seeing this uh, show up again and again. Um, because you share audiences, are there ways that you can partner with organizations in completely different sectors to either share knowledge and organizational expertise, or are there ways that you can start to reach into their audiences now to reconnect, and then they can reach back into yours later in the year? So something to think about. Look at the crossover. We don't, we think it's a little bit strange, but it's our audiences don't think about it in the same way. Um, I think it's important also to recognize that we know that there's sharing audiences, but when it comes to sports and recreation versus arts and culture, there are some different attitudes. Um, for arts and culture purists or hardcore audiences, the current enthusiasm levels aren't, aren't necessarily going to translate into attendance in the short term. Not only are those experiences not being offered, but we're seeing a little bit more hesitancy particularly among some of the key decision makers. Um, women and uh, mums, um, people who are previous enthusiasts are clearly exhibiting more wariness to engage with crowds. 
So that might give you a longer runway for uh, getting back to normal. We know lots of organizations aren't looking until uh, late in 2020, early in 2021 to reconnect on a physical basis, but or on a live basis. But keep in mind that your planning should reflect it. Um, for sports and recreation, we know that planning can ramp up more quickly and it will for those organizations, but they're going to have to think about different things. So they might want to be tapping into the expertise of organizations in this sector um, who have lots of experience reconnecting and engaging with audiences um, to help them reach out as well. Um, we talked about motivations more than activities as being key. And I think the intrinsic motivations is one of the big ahas coming out of this, this study. And what people will do is, is gonna change, but why they're there in the first place is not. And while we know that our audiences are more wary, their desire for social experiences are um, still very strong. So that means we have to understand the motivations for the activity in the first place and then think about how your organization delivers it. So not every organization is going to deliver social on the same degree or learning in the same degree or experiential in the same degree. So it's never a bad thing to think about what you offer and what motivations you're hitting on for those audiences. It also means that you can leverage those motivations to build substitution activities. Uh, Patty co-authored a paper with Dr. Finch that uh, some of us participated in as well about substitution experiences and a lot of that has to do with the motivations. So you can think about that and to what degree can you facilitate the social connections people are craving right now? How do you deliver the meaningful and authentic experiences people want? Can you do it now and how do you do it post pandemic? Again, something to think about. Um, we've heard a lot about the substitution activities and the fact that we're having this uh, town hall on Zoom is a great example of a substitution activity. Um, but Albertans are uh, challenged to substitute the experiences right now and fatigue is starting to set in as Kim had pointed out. Um, not everything can be met in the same way and people are getting tired of just seeing the same digital. Um, so if, if we can't meet their motivations can we view the substitutions as more as a companion to the real thing? There can be just as much damage for organizations if they try to recreate what they offer in a digital format. Instead, maybe look at different ways of connecting with them instead of just offering what you do normally in a digital world. You might also look into what the capabilities are that you can leverage. There are unique advantages of the virtual experiences that you can build around that and add value to audiences. So there are some examples we've seen where arts organizations have offered a digital version of what they've had, but then also have the opportunity to connect with other members of the audience. So it meets a social while reconnecting on their experiential. So look for ways to leverage the tools to connect more deeply, not just re recreate. Perhaps the most important thing that we're seeing out of this work is, is that it's the comfort levels that's going to dictate re-engagement. None of us can make a decision on when to reopen. That's a public health decision. But getting audiences to come down, even though we are open, is going to take time. And that's based on comfort. So some are going to be hesitant to re-engage. We need to adjust their expectations on how attendance will rebound. So if we know decision um, um, makers are more wary, we need to say things to them that are going to make them more comfortable. So your messaging doesn't need to just calm the hesitation, but level the motivations. So show them the safeguards that are in place because that's table stakes. But then remind them of the motivations and the experiences that they're going to be getting and the reasons why they love to come in the first place. So it has to be a double, uh, a double message. Um, I think the other thing is, is that keep in mind that the overlap of economic concern is going to be emerging for some time. I know there's reports of oil prices coming back slightly, but these, these types of recessionary uh, uh, episodes take a lot longer to recover. Many studies have shown time and again when this kind of economic condition takes place that consumer spending on things like that are discretionary take much longer to come back. So spending power is going to be impacted and that might impact your ability to uh, drive them. So you need to be thinking about pricing strategies that are going to balance value offers. Um, look at promotional strategies that are going to support the notion of value and exclusivity of experience. But then also recognize that in this kind of environment, 
consumers' behavior is going to shift. They're not just more value conscious. Yes, they are. But they're also coming with much higher expectations because they're more judicious in their spending. As a result, they're going to expect a lot more when they do spend it. So they're going to be a harder customer to please. Um, the less optimistic outlook, the sense of worry is something that we're going to continue to investigate. Um, we don't expect that this is going to go away anytime soon. Um, there might be ways that are advantages, particularly from the experience economy and those in arts and culture, that you can appeal to audience to tap into the unarticulated motivations that comes in this kind of market. And what we mean by that is you offer an opportunity to escape, even, even if it's in the digital substitution of this time. But you can also offer the opportunity to comfort through the emotional benefits that come uniquely from the arts and culture experiences. So building and evolving the experiences that tap into that may offer organizations a unique opportunity to gain attention, but also deepen the engagement, probably in ways more than they previously thought before. So as I mentioned, this is the tip of the iceberg. And um, we could probably talk about this for hours, but are there questions, things that are coming up that um, we, would, we can share at this point in time? Thanks very much, Matt and Kim. Um, uh, Gregory and uh, Melissa will um, be monitoring the questions. Um, we've had a few come up so far. Oh, have we had a few come up so far? I'm just looking at the questions page. Um, where can we sign up to get updates from Stone Olufsen and this reporting? So um, as Matt and Kim were making their presentation, uh, Greg has been adding links in the chat box uh, uh, that you can click on. Um, and uh, uh, there's also a, um, a subscriber button that you can sign up. So as the second wave of data comes out and the subsequent, subsequent waves, because remember this is a longitudinal study, um, we'll definitely find ways to invite um, uh, Matt and Kim uh, back to share that data. Um, but I, I would really encourage you to sign up to get the uh, data as it's released and also to take Matt and Kim up on their offer. Um, excuse me, if you have any questions after. Um, you know, some of you may want to share this with your marketing teams if you have them um, or those on your board who are helping you. Um, and a little bit later, I'll talk about some of those um, partnering strategies that Matt spoke to about how we might bring together others who are also in the experience economy. Um, looking for more questions. Is it possible to get a copy of the PowerPoint presentation that Matthew yeah. just shared? Uh, Matt, that's on your site as well, right? Yep. If not, I'll uh, provide it to Sarah and the team as well. And we'll put it on our, I think it's already on our website. I could be wrong. Um, but uh, someone, someone from the team will correct me in the chat box if, uh, if that's the case. Um, just I believe the full reports are available on our website and yours. Um, yes. And then Matt, you'll send this shortened version through if anyone would like to have access to it. And then as we um, uh, uh, will share the recording of, uh, of the town hall as well. So uh, some of you may want to take that piece uh, uh, from, from Matt and Kim and share it uh, within your organizations or with other organizations who maybe aren't here today um, uh, so they can benefit. I, I find the slides are really great on their own, um, but getting that additional commentary from, from uh, Kim and Matt is uh, super helpful um, in terms of how it might apply to you and how you can use it in your organization. That was one of the things that we asked um, of Stone Olufsen at the time uh, the survey was being designed. We had to be able to find a way for all of you to use it. Um, and then if there are any data nerds out there, Greg notwithstanding, um, uh, the actual tables themselves are open source. So if you have the ability and you want to look at the data more explicitly, you can actually go and look into those tables as well. Yeah. Patty, um, if I can add, it's a lot to absorb, I know. So if people have questions later on, please feel free to email us. Um, our contact information is on the page or the CADA team and put us in touch. We're, we'll do what we can to help. We want to see you thrive and recover. 
Thank you. Uh, Matt and Kim, there's a question here from uh, Madan. Considering discretionary spending is an issue, do you think making events free for public will bring more people to arts events? Um, great question. We get that a lot and not just in the current time. Free only takes you so far. Um, it helps because of discretionary spending, but it's not going to be the silver bullet. And that's because free doesn't match up with their primary motivation of social. It helps. Um, over the long term, organizations tend to suffer if they offer or lean on free uh, because of the financial implications and the expectation that uh, comes with free that's different than the promise of an experience. So it will help but I don't think that it's going to be as beneficial as emphasizing the, the benefits of engaging in the first place, which may be social or experiential, depending on the offer. Can, Can I add to that, Matt? Yeah, I'd like to. The one thing I will say, and this is tipping our hand to future waves, um, this is something that we think we'll be exploring. We're starting to explore in wave two, and we'll continue to explore in future waves as it becomes really something at the forefront uh, understanding how spending will shift, where people are willing to put their money, how they're willing to spend, where they're willing to go, all of those sorts of questions. And the one thing that is just niggling in the back of our mind for down the road is that we also don't want organizations to leave money on the table. So certainly there's going to have to be a value aspect, I think, that will, organizations will need to be mindful of. Um, but if there are audiences and their comfort level is at a place where they're willing to visit you or go to somewhere, uh, you don't want to leave money on the table when there might be something that you can gain from that. So I don't have the answer of what that looks like. It's just to say, I don't know if it is, you know, free or full price. And I think we'll be looking to explore that in more detail in the coming months. So just kind of keep your eye out for that. Thanks very much, Kim. Um, those are all the questions that uh, I see from the chat and that the team has collected. So um, again, we, we still have uh, j just about a half an hour uh, to go. So if something occurs to you and you want to ask it, please um, let us uh, know and uh, we'll be sure to uh, uh, have Matt or Kim um, address that. Um, so uh, the, the next piece that I just wanted to um, update you on is uh, sort of other things that are happening with Calgary Arts Development um, as we move ahead into the rest of 2020 and, and um, uh, the things that are, are rising to the surface. And a lot of it is related to the very conversations that we've been sharing with you uh, today. Um, uh, uh, one thing in particular, and, and I, uh, and it was something that really rang very true to me with uh, uh, the findings that Matt and Kim identified, were really just around these opportunities to partner, to partner up, to think about working outside of the arts sector, but really thinking about the experience of economy as a broader idea, and um, you know the paper uh, that. Uh, Dr. Finch invited me to participate on, starts to introduce what this whole idea of an experience economy is. Um, I'll preface it right now. It's, it's a bit on the heavier on the academic side, <laughs> but when you partner it up with the research that Matt and Kim have prepared, um, I think it starts to give some context for how I believe the arts are such a significant part of that and, and really truly could pave the way for the longer term recovery for Calgary's um, community uh, from an economic perspective, among others. Um, in that same spirit, as we thought about the design of the Emergency Resiliency Fund programs, we were also mindful that we have a number of, of partners and collaborators and allies working with us who are just as concerned as we are around um, how we um, facilitate and build uh, and strengthen the arts sector in light of the times. And, and one of those close partners is Simon Mallet and the team from the Rosé Foundation. And so I thought I'd invite Simon just to spend a few minutes uh, sharing with you some of the things that the Rosé Foundation is doing um, that where we're trying to really leverage um, the programs that we're running and, and not step on each other's toes. So uh, uh, Simon, can I call on you to turn your mic on and share with us a little bit about what, what up? For sure, thanks Patty. 
Um, so uh, for those of you on the call who are not familiar with the Rosé Foundation, uh, we are a, a private foundation that supports the arts in Alberta. Uh, and we support transformational leadership in the arts. And we do that in a number of ways. Uh, we have a granting program for uh, Calgary and area um, charitable arts organizations. We have a suite of three arts leadership programs that focus on sort of uh, the business capacity in, in the arts. Uh, then we have the, the Rosé Awards, one for excellence in arts management and one for excellence in board leadership, which unfortunately due to uh, COVID have, have uh, been cancelled for this year. Um, but we look forward to welcoming the community and celebrating um, some, some great stories of resilience and, and uh, overcoming adversity uh, next year for sure. Um, and so uh, one of the things that we've been doing um, as this situation has been evolving is, is trying to get information into the hands of arts organizations um, as it sort of uh, comes at useful times. Uh, so the first one of these that we did was, was around uh, remote working and tips for working from home as a lot of arts organizations made that shift. Um, we did one around the, the various uh, funding supports available to Alberta-based artists and arts organizations. And then more recently we did one on um, monetizing online arts content. Uh, very much to speak to the question earlier around whether or not these should be given away for free or in fact how uh, what, what are some strategies and tactics around uh, attempting to to monetize the art that is being delivered. Um, all of that information is on our website at rosefoundation.org. Uh, I'll put that in the chat but it's R-O-Z-S-A foundation.org. And so now we're sort of looking forward and, and because we sort of live at this intersection of business and the arts, you know, we do a lot of work around uh, capacity building, around looking at organizational models, uh, looking at new pathways forward, uh, adaptive capacity, how organizations can make themselves uh, stronger in the long term. And so our next session is, is very much uh, looking at the kinds of things that, that Patty, Sarah and, and the CATA team are looking at supporting in, in the second phase of their uh, emergency support funding, which is around that resiliency piece, which is around um, what new opportunities might we want to seek? How might we form partnerships either between arts organizations or between uh, arts organizations and organizations from other sectors? Um, uh, how can we, you know, what, what, what might a merger look like if, it, if, it, if that is a way to go? But there are, there are a variety of, of different models. We do, you know, I think we know that things are going to look different as we uh, come out of the COVID situation than they did before the COVID situation. And, and, and that adaptive capacity, that ability for organizations to, um, to adapt and find productive ways forward is going to be central to that. And so closer to uh, the opening of that second wave, which is August 10th, I believe, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Keda, but um, uh, we're going to be looking at putting together an information session. Um, we don't know exactly what that's going to be because part of what we want to do is hear from arts organizations around what questions are you facing, what possibilities are you looking at, um, what information do you need, um, and, then, and then let us help you. Let us uh, try and find folks who can speak to that, uh, speak from their experience, speak tactically about the logistics that might be involved um, in order to better position organizations to be able to apply for some of this funding that CADA uh, has been made available. Uh, I, I'm, I'm very excited for the, the approach that CADA has, has taken because I do think it gives uh, arts organizations a great opportunity to, to sort of um, make lemonade, I suppose, uh, and lemonade, I, I really love lemonade, um, but, but to take you know, uh, a situation that is uh, less than ideal in many ways, and, uh, but, but to forge a new future, to um, you know, see, what, see what might be possible on the other side. Uh, it's been great to work with CADA um, as well as our friends at the Calgary Foundation throughout this uh, on funding approaches, on a lot of strategy, a lot of conversations. Uh, CADA has been a real leader in terms of sort of pulling um, funders together to have conversations about how we can uh, come together and work together to support you. So if you have thoughts, uh, questions, perspectives that you'd like to, to talk about, to share, uh, please get in touch with me personally. Uh, my email is simon at rosefoundation.org. Again, I'll put that in the chat. Um, but reach out to me, uh, let us know what you're thinking about. Um, it will help us to, uh, to sort of um, design this to, to meet the needs of our organizations uh, that much more fully. Uh, one last point. Um, there's a, a Patty made a comment earlier about uh, data nerds. Uh, I like to think uh, of, of folks as data connoisseurs, Patty. Uh, 
it's a, a certain okay. palette that, uh, <laughs> that the, the processes it in beautiful ways. So uh, anyway, thanks for the time. Thanks very much, Simon. Uh, aficionados, I guess, would be a, a good term. Um, I also note if you're on the call that our, our friend Bridget uh, von Rothenberg from the Calgary Foundation is here. And we work very, very closely with the Calgary Foundation and are very um, proud of our relationship. Uh, Bridget has a tiny bit of an update as well. So uh, over to you, Bridget. Thanks, Patty. Um, yeah, so we're right now over the summertime our grants team is working on the next phase of grant of our pandemic recovery program. Um, but in sort of tandem with that, we are reopening our strategic opportunity granting program, um, hopefully for the month of August. So I just wanted to get the word out there. Um, we're going to be uh, tweaking the guidelines to be more. Um, mindful of our current co current context so if anyone would like to have a chat you can re reach me at grants at calgaryfoundation.org or you can reach me on my phone at 403-802-7724 i'd be happy to have a chat with anyone thanks thanks so much bridget maybe if you could type that contact info into the chat box and then sure. people have it that'd be awesome got it uh, we are, and apparently we got shirt orders for data connoisseurs. So I smell a social enterprise happening there, guys. You go for it. Um, okay, so uh, uh, we're just going to uh, use uh, uh, a little bit of our, or well, the rest of our remaining time, and we uh, about twenty minutes. Not uh, hopefully we can finish up a bit sooner. Um, I know these calls can be long when they get past ninety minutes. Uh, just some other opportunities that might be coming up for you that I'd invite you to think about. Um, and if you want more information uh, on our Calgary Arts Development website, all of our contact is, info is there. So uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to us uh, if you have any questions. Um, you heard me mention earlier that we've been undertaking and hosting some anti-racism virtual town halls. Um, we have committed to holding um, uh, more town halls uh, every other Wednesday in um, July and August. So the next one will be next Wednesday, uh, which I think is the 15th. Um, and you can go to our website uh, to register uh, for, for those town for that town hall. Um, and also uh, we have the recordings and transcripts of our previous two town halls that have already taken place. And uh, you're invited to, to uh, uh, review those. The purpose of these town halls is really um, a bit of an, uh, an exchange and to listen to um, uh, the, the thoughts and the feelings and the concerns that are being raised uh, by many um, artists, um, many of whom are BIPOC, um, uh, Black, Indigenous, people of color, as well as AWD artists with disabilities. Um, these are stories that sometimes we don't hear as a funder and we do need to hear and in ways that are more than um, what the what is on the grapevine and the town hall for me has been a wonderful way to really start to hear and better understand um, what it means for an art sector that looks like calgary canada's third most diverse city in canada and um so uh, the conversations have just been um, uh, sometimes uncomfortable, uh, deeply fulfilling, a wonderful learning, um, and, and I, I hope a, a safe space and a brave space where people can, can bring up uh, some questions and thoughts. Uh, so those are our every other Wednesday uh, for the next two months uh, starting next week. Um, related to that, we committed in those sessions to uh, uh, create an external EDIA working group. And this is to help us figure out how we might change our systems to better accommodate what it is to have the variety of amazing arts that our community has to offer when it looks like our city. And so um, we're going to put a call out for nominations. 
And so um, stay tuned on our website. If you have interest or you know of people who might be great uh, members of that working committee, uh, for those who are not employed by an organization where this might be part of their work already, we will compensate you as a member of the working committee. Um, we want to value the expertise and the lived experience that individuals will bring and share with us and teach us. Um, so stay tuned for that. Um, related more directly to uh, uh, the work that you heard from Stone Olufsen today, um, Calgary Arts Development has been meeting with a number of arts champions in our community and um, from a, a number of different places uh, inside and outside of the arts to work on um, uh, something called Rise Up Calgary. And Rise Up Calgary, again, is an open source campaign to accelerate the arts sector's recovery, the economic recovery in Calgary. And it's using the data and the research that we've discovered, what we're learning about an experience economy and how the arts fits into that, um, and really wanting to use rise up Calgary as an opportunity to create awareness for Calgarians that the arts are here and that as I said earlier Calgarians have been leaning on the arts a lot since March and even before and we want to keep that presence that acknowledgement alive regardless of whether there's COVID-19 and uh, we hope that the Rise Up Calgary campaign might be a way to do that. Now, it's more than just marketing and promotions. So here's, here's the pitch. As you think about the resiliency fund application you might want to put in, or you're talking with your colleagues in arts and culture, or in sport and recreation, or in hospitality, what are those amazing experiences that you could afford or provide to Calgarians right now? And so one initiative that will take place under the Rise Up Calgary banner are the Rise Up Experience packages. We've approached some of Calgary's hotels who are opening up partially to offer deep discounts, put that together with a, a fantastic arts experience, and then add on a little bit of Calgary's local food scene to create a, a wonderful kind of staycation package for uh, 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 Calgarians and those around us to take part in. And so Kaylee Bysegal, who you heard about earlier, is going to be our, our, our queen of matching people together and experiences together. And um, uh, if you are interested, stay tuned on our website again, and we'll put something in our newsletter. We're going to get going pretty quick here on how we can put these packages together. Similar to that, uh, colleague Graham Edge from Energy Disruptors is initiating an event called YYC Stay, S-T-A-Y, K-C-A-Y. So YYC Stay K is a 29-day scavenger hunt for uniquely YYC experiences. And for sure, arts and culture is a part of that. So the trick to this one is the 29-day period starts on July 24th, which is 16 days from now. And by the way, Graham started this idea 10 days ago when he was part of a bounce back YYC hackathon that Kata also participated in where a group of three students identified this idea of a local scavenger hunt as a means of contributing to building Calgarians comfort in this time as we come out of COVID-19. So again, for those of you who might have a really awesome idea for how you could be one of the scavenger sites, or maybe you want to share this information with your own community so they have an experience they can take part in. Um, we'll have more information on our website. We have a rough draft of a, a slide deck that Graham has shared. He's got some changes to it, but I think it's a really, again, wonderful way to show how the arts can lead in building a great city again for all of us. 
So that, that's my pitch for Rise Up. There'll be a number of other activities that um, um, will come up. When I talk about open source, it, that means if you want to be part of Rise Up Calgary and you've got something to bring to the table, then you can be a part of Rise Up Calgary. Um, uh, this is entirely something we want to build from the grassroots. Um, above and beyond that, always happy to promote and share your events, both online and offline, um, uh, your job postings, notices of workshops, any kind of events listing. Uh, we can, um, we'd love to share that information uh, with the broader community. So I think maybe Nick can put, um, is going to put there you go look at that he's putting the link right in the chat box right there so you can uh, make your submissions to the various listings um, in that it, it, at those links uh, we've also resumed our weekly newsletter so always wanting to share amazing stories um, about the arts and that is a good segue to the last thing i wanted to share with you um, uh, of initiatives that we're uh, undertaking uh, you've likely heard me talk a lot about what living a creative life, that our citywide arts strategy uh, is called Living a Creative Life, launched in 2014, and really at its heart was how could we create the conditions in Calgary where Calgarians can live their most creative lives with arts and artists at the center of those conditions. And so in that ongoing mission to create those conditions, I'm so pleased to announce that today we are launching our first webisode of Living a Creative Life. And it's about how Calgarians have leaned on the arts during the pandemic and beyond and how we can share stories of our most creative Calgarians, of which there are thousands. Um, we want to share those stories. And I believe we have a tiny little promo teaser. So Helen, can I hand it over to you to uh, hit play on that teaser? There's no sound. And there's me with moving hands. Maybe it's your host. Sorry, Maybe there's no sound, I guess. Celebration of Creative Calgarians. We can hear it now. But now we can't see it. Um, do you want me to try it again? Would, would you mind? And let's see if it works. And if not, then we'll just move on. I don't mind. I usually say that being an artist makes me a better nurse, and being a nurse makes me a better no, artist. No, we can't do it, but we can't see it. COVID-19, we want creativity to be contagious. I started creating a body of work. I call it the pandemic's gift to me. I'm Adora Wolfor, your host. Join me in a celebration of Creative Calgarians. Okay, well, so you saw it first, and then you heard it. But our web series will put both together, and it will be a beautiful, beautiful thing. It was uh, just such a joy. Um, Nick has put the link to the teaser trailer for our new web series, Living a Creative Life. So you can have a look there. I'm sure every single one of you on this call has a story of a creative Calgarian. And it might be you, or it might be someone that you know. And we would love to hear about it. Um, and uh, Adora, who is our uh, host, um, is just an, a wonderful, wonderful Calgarian. And I'm just so thrilled that uh, she'll be able to share these stories with everybody. Um, uh, someone from the team, can you remind me about how people might access the web series, the first episode on its launch, given that it's today? Look at that. Thanks, Nick. The first episode of Living a Creative Life, the link is in the chat box. Again, you can go to our website at Calgary Arts Development, and um, uh, uh, we'll... Uh, 
uh, uh, sorry, I just got caught up with the, the chat box. Um, uh, the episodes there at the link that you've uh, chosen, Sherry has put the contact info, submit your stories to submissions at calvaryartsdevelopment.com. Um, Landon, uh, we're working on ensuring that captioning appears throughout the episode um, for this first one. We just did it for, uh, um, for uh, Candice, the artist, um, but uh, we are looking to ensure that we have captioning included for all of the future episodes, so thank you for that note. Okay, eight minutes to spare unless anybody has any more questions or comments that you want to share. I'm going to check on our handy dandy Google Doc to be sure I haven't missed anything. Don't think I have. Uh, oh, Landon, captioning is available for the full episode, just not in the trailer. So there you go. Um, I'm just scanning quickly through the chat box. I think those are all the comments and questions that we've had. Um, once again, many, many thanks to our guests, Matthew Stone and Kim Griffin, uh, Sarah and her team in community investment, uh, Melissa and Taylor and Sable and Marta and Alicia and Kaylee, thank you so much. Uh, Bridget and Simon, thank you for letting me put you on the spot and sharing uh, information and updates from our other partners. Um, uh, there's just, you know, as hard as this year has been, it would have been a hundred times harder without the partnership of all those people I just spoke uh, about and thanked. So um, um, thank you very much to all of you. And then of course, uh, we're only here because you're here, because you make up the arts community. There's no reason to have a CADA if there isn't an arts community here to build and contribute to building an amazing city for all of us. So many thanks to all of you for taking this time. And, and for spending and taking two hours of your day on Zoom with us. So uh, until next time, we'll have more updates. Uh, August will be the second wave of the research. In the meantime, our next anti-racism virtual town hall will be next Wednesday. So um, thanks again, everybody, and we will see you soon. Bye.